Hello and welcome to the Business Octopus, where we talk about all things sales, marketing, and technology. I'm Avon Collis, CRM and Marketing Automation Specialist at Relevate and All Around Good Guy. Today, I am joined by Darren Barsh from Barana, here to talk about how to get the most out of your software investment. Welcome, Darren. How are you going? Oh, fantastic. Thanks for having me on, Col. Um, Avon, appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I haven't been called that since uh, being in the army, so uh, <laughs> always handy. Yeah, look, I, I think you know you got you run a software like a custom software development generally for like the large enterprise uh, market space, and you know for us in the CRM world, you know we're constantly implementing you know already existing tools, and I think we share a lot of the same things yeah. in, in terms of how we're working with clients. And so what we wanted to talk about today is just what it's like on the on, from our perspective, and and how a customer can get a better investment or a better uh, outcome when they're when they're working with us so you know we want everyone to be successful and so it, hopefully uh, this podcast will will help people to you know take some better actions make some better decisions and make sure it's a really good project Absolutely. so yeah thanks for coming along today and so the first thing i want to ask you is uh, when uh, is the right time to speak to an implementation partner or a custom developer i think there's a few processes that need to go into place before someone would come to us we think we look at a development or a custom development sort of in three parts as sort of the vision, you know, what uh, someone's reason for wanting to do the development, some research and use case of what's out there in the marketplace already and some goals. That's sort of the vision side for us. And then there's a strategy side, which sometimes would be implemented by guys like yourself, business coaches, consultants, which requires all the engineering requirements of putting together a, a development, all the planning, all the, the prototypes and use um, user experiences and all that before they'd even come to us. So it's a bit like doing a, a prototype first in preparation before they would come to a, to a partner to code and develop it. So we, we are really the last point of call, so to speak, in a, in a process of a development. And I, I believe that it really requires a team effort to, to come together to put a, a custom development together. It's not like just going to a, someone who's already built some software, it's already in place. I think there's a lot of planning and preparation that would be needed before you you come to to do custom software yeah and I, i'd agree 100 percent. i even think that um you know it's really hard to come up with the whole thing on day one like yeah i think most of the time people think um you know it's like this or it's like that as in like it's like zero or it's like that try to give you something that it equates to uh, and one thing we always talk about is like the corporate value chain what does your business do that's different and better than every other business because when you try to do the same thing, then you don't achieve that competitive advantage. You just sort of sit alongside or behind um, the, the company that you're trying to follow. So, um, and, you know, we talked a, uh, a little bit offline about how, you know, sometimes do they even really need the platform? Do they really need the software? Uh, I think sometimes that maybe a redesign of, of the process, you know, we had a client, we had a, a uh, we talked through their whole sales process, mapped it out on the whiteboard in front of them. And basically they had one sort of person or small team uh, who were the bottleneck because the, the first people would take the customer call and then route it to this other person. And then if they were busy, they'd have to do a call back. And so, you know, quite often customers would just go to the next one on Google. And, oh. uh, and so they reshuffled their whole process so that the first responder could also book the appointment and, you know, schedule the, the, the call out basically. Um, yes. and whilst that first call took a lot longer, um, they had to grow their almost double their team because they were closing more deals. They were getting more first appointments. They were serving the customer. So, um, you know, I think the process change, we didn't even, we didn't even implement any software at all in that one. That's yeah. a perfect example. So. Yeah. That happens a lot, I think. I don't think people take that into account before they decide to build. I think the planning, exactly what you were saying there, is critical. Mm. Absolutely I, I think, critical. I think a lot of people really, that there's, there's the problems that people think they have, and then there's the things, you know, like, do you treat the symptoms or the cause? Um, yeah. You know, someone goes, I need sales. And so they invest all this money in Google Ads, in... Um, you know, websites and all that and a sales team and all that front end stuff. But there could be something in the back end that could really change the game and, and actually make a difference. Yeah. yeah. So do you find that quite regular? Absolutely. I I advise a lot of the time for for 
companies not to go custom because a lot of the times there is those opportunities. They need to fix up their systems, of course, to start with. Mm. That's where you guys are an expert in what you do there to be able to implement those systems that they need in the back end. Mm. And half the problem is those back end systems. They're not in place. They, yeah. Their critical client flow of process from marketing to closure is not in place with all their, their touch points with the client. Mm. A lot of those are not in place. And I think that's where sometimes they need to come to companies like Relevate where, you know, to get all those systems in place before you can increase your marketing. Because uh, you, you need to be able to get that automation in place and ultimately saves your money in the, in the end. Yeah, no, I mean, we always talk about a roadmap. So like, yeah. that, say, for example, someone might start off on small business software and then go to something like Salesforce and then, uh, uh, and then get that up to an enterprise level and then go, all right, well, now we've got this unique challenge we need to solve. Let's do some custom stuff. But, you know, like what we were saying before, like uh, refining the processes, knowing what the process is and, and, you know, the buttons and fields you need from day one is really hard if you don't have a template. Um, exactly. So you've got to come up with it from scratch, uh, but it's better to, to learn along the way and, 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 um, and build that out. So, you know, maybe in the roadmap plan, the, the custom will come. It will just mean that um, you need to have an example, something that's now not working. You can take 60, 80% of that, put it in the new solution and then build and advance and develop on top of that. Yeah, of course. And then there's also the thought of, you know, add, I, I, one of the biggest things that I see in custom development or in software is people don't take into account their data. Their data is really a critical point. Mm. Some companies are okay storing their data in the cloud in somebody else's uh, database or somebody mm. else's software. But there's some solutions where a company needs to have their data. They need to have their intellectual property. So because mm. their business model determines that they have control of that mm. uh, sensitive. Um, horses for courses though, you know, I just see. Well, I mean, that, that can be, that can be corporate, like big corporate or government or, you know, like every time you access these things in cloud servers, it costs a fee, you know, we've got people who have, um, you know, like some Amazon stuff and, and yeah, they go, oh, it's scalable pricing, but then they have a, a peak or a spike or something. And then they're paying like a thousand dollars an hour or something for the volume of, of stuff. Yes. Yeah. So all of a sudden the, pro the flexible pricing is not that attractive. No. So um, where do you, where do you see, obviously both of us go through these large projects, yeah. you know, we're talking with a customer a long time. Um, where do you see that they commonly go wrong? I, I don't think they do enough planning up front. Mm. And I don't think they review to see if they really need to get something done custom out in the market space. So I think it's that vision and strategy they get wrong. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I see. So I see, because you can have the same idea or the same piece of software and you can do a multitude of different things with it based on your goals. So you might, for example, you might have a piece of uh, some SaaS software that you decide to build because you want to use it for yourself only. You've got something that'll be good in your business and cool. So there's a certain uh, set of strategy and planning and systems that you put in place for that. But if you're going to then build it as a business, then obviously the scaling of that is completely different to using it in your business. Mm. All that comes back to planning, setting up all your systems and processes and all your planning, uh, getting your MVP and getting your prototype of how the whole process is going to come together before you even build. So we truly believe you shouldn't build uh, any software without having five different things in place. So we, we believe you should have the workflow sorted out. You need to get your UX, you know, your design sorted out before you would do anything. Uh, you need to get all your work breakdown structures, which is basically how you're going to build it over what sort of time frame it's going to be built yeah. and getting all your entity relationship diagrams databases how's everything going to work and you have it's like a, a software development plan that you would put together before you would even develop anything mm. and I, I think the biggest mistake i see in our industry is people just start <laughs> and they where they are going to finish is a totally different place they might start here and they finish over there but if you've got a plan in place you know where you're going you know when things are going to be done mm. and it's going to be done to plan. So I think uh, planning is one of the biggest mistakes when someone does uh, custom software and they do it for the wrong reasons. So it's really important that that vision and strategy come together before you build anything. That's what we've learned over the last couple of years. I, th I think, um, you know, sort of further to that point, you know, I, I think for us, it's like, um, you know, the customers lives the problem every day. 
And, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe having the plan, like if, if the plan changes, then, you know, as long as you've got a plan, you're only incrementally moving a little thing, but not like you're all of a sudden you're building in this direction then you go, oh, no, let's change your mind. And then you build in that direction and you kind of forget yeah. what was that you were trying to solve at day one. Um, yeah. And along the way, you know, new problems come up and it's just what become, what feels really important in that moment because it causes you the most stress that day or, or something like that. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that as a, as a sort of a partner or an external is you kind of bring that little bit of clarity of, because you've seen it before, mm. you, you've seen that on like 20, 30, 100 different businesses and you can apply certain thinking. Uh, yes. But one thing I think is a big problem is they think that the partner will do everything. I mean, you know, we don't live in their business every day. And, mm. and one thing that they can do or a customer can do is really make it easier because we don't know what we don't know. Uh, just course. to really understand their business model and what it is they're trying to achieve. So like you said, all the diagrams, like process yeah. flow maps and all that sort of stuff. You know, I always try to interview people at different levels. So I, I want to talk to the, to the end user, maybe even some customers, um, talk to middle management and as well as senior, because sometimes there's a big disconnect between um, the coalface worker on the front line and the, the, the management who have come up, you know, maybe they've been in the business for 20 years and they know it how it's been for them, but they don't know how it is right now for the person on the ground. Exactly. And then you get the disconnect. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, like as you know, business are moving so fast these days, you know, I think that, um, not sharing information in a timely manner tends yeah. to knock everything forward. Um, and then even undercooking the product, not giving it the attention that it needs, the time that it needs. I think sometimes people go, all right, my budget is X, just make it happen for that. But in yeah. reality, that might cause more problems than it's worth in the long run. Yeah, and that's that's another thing. It's being realistic on timeframes and budgets yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, and the I can guarantee you, if it's something new, the budget will go out further than what you think. So you'll have an estimate. Let's say, for example, it's a hundred thousand, and you know that's what you estimate over this time period. And when you're going into the unknown, yeah. unfortunately, sometimes budgets go out because yeah. you, you, you're moving into the unknown and you get to, to points in the process. That's why I believe you should always plan. I think mm. that's, that's the reason why you plan to get all those things. The other, the other mistake I see people make is they, they start a project and then they try to change it all through the, all through the steps yeah. and they, they don't actually ever finish it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then they, it creates that that's what creates the delays and, and, and problems with budgets because mm. we haven't done the planning up front. So mm. sure it, things evolve as we know yes. where you started to where you finish changes. Mm. So that's where I think uh, sometimes it's good to put something together and then come back and, and do a second phase or a third phase mm. with all those changes, but at least get whatever you're going to start as far as your, your minimum viable product up and running yeah. so that you can go out and test because when you go out and test, you might get different feedback than what you thought when you were originally starting the project mm. and the feedback then changes your whole model. So when you're starting, the other suggestion and feedback I have is make sure you start with the minimum, get your feedback, listen to it and implement. Hey, it might be the same thing that you thought of originally, mm. but the market may determine you need to change directions and then you can implement that feedback faster and, and mm. get a, a, a better quality software down in the long run. I always say it's not like uh, the field of dreams. If you build it, they become. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. You have to want it first. Exactly. Um, and, you know, sort of another, another aspect there, I guess, is that, um, there's a huge uh, possibility for scope creep because people yeah. sort of say, oh, it would be nice if uh, along the way, because the, quite often the customer has a lot of aha moments as they're yeah. going through the process and they're learning more stuff and capabilities. And they go, oh, it would be nice if we could do this. It would be nice if we could do that. Or, you know, I don't like that button blue. Can you make it green? Um, all these little things add up. And I think yeah. sometimes you've got you've to work with that bare bones uh, and just be okay with that because uh, and and you know we, we always give them a, like a, a list you know if you don't like it add it to the list and then yeah. we'll put it in the backlog and prioritize in future so if it's a color of a button problem uh i think that's pretty low if yeah. it's a um something that's going to deliver you know a 30 hour a week saving based on uh some reporting or something like that uh, i think that's pretty important so we'll rank that one quite up 
Yeah, that's why I think uh, it's really important to build a prototype because mm. in that, because half the, let me try and put it in a really simple term. You're building a house. Mm. You've got a plan. You're building the house. You've built the wall. You've bricked it in. You've done everything you need to for that wall. Then all of a sudden you just, you say, I want to put a door there and a window there in the, 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 the part that's already been bricks. So and now you've got to knock it down yeah. and rebuild it. And the structure is never the same. So I, I always think that's why you do a prototype because in the prototype, you mm. can make those changes and it saves you a lot of time and money because now you haven't coded. Mm. Once you've coded, you've got to go change everything. In the prototype, it's a lot easier. So then you can go, ah, oh, as you work through the prototype, pushing buttons, see where everything's going to work. That also helps uh, minimize your costs from future development as well. And I don't think enough people put enough emphasis on prototyping. I think the, the, the house analogy is good, but uh, there's nothing more... Um, it's it's more more of a problem than that because you know with a house you can drive past it you can mm. sit in it you can uh, you know you can walk around it lay in it sleep in it whatever but on a software the moment you're not logged in it's an intangible it doesn't exist yeah. in your mind it's not there so unless you're you're in it and and I think that's where you know sometimes you could have something that is is gigantic and they only ever see ten percent of it so for them it's only ten percent of 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 the project or, or like that's the whole project so yeah. it, it can be really hard to communicate that value yes i so agreed what is the benefits of a digital ready business oh i think systems inside of a business and a, a digital business can be systemized and i think uh mm. it's one of the things that i don't think enough businesses put enough credit on is systemizing there's a uh, book which i've got here which i would highly recommend it's called systemology I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, written by a guy called Dave Jantz. And, and I think uh, with di with digital ready business, you can systemize everything and, and be able to work on your business and not in it. So it makes it a lot, uh, it's more saleable, uh, a digital business. I think I, I can't put enough credit towards having systems in your business. And guys like you and I, we can help businesses do that. We mm. can help them take away because... Um, Manpower is time. Time is money. If you can get a digital system that can work automatically behind the scenes for you, that's saving you time, money. It's, it's, you know, more profit on your bottom line. I think, um, you know, that sort of scalability and, and, you know, a lot of times people go, oh, you know, we spend X amount of hours building this software and an X amount of dollars, but, you know, people don't necessarily equate the fact that now someone can, work, uh, you know, do an extra hour a day, uh, which I, you know, 365 hours a year or something like that, uh, the returns can be phenomenal or, you know, just the, the better customer service or like there's so much intangibility that yeah. is really, really hard to calculate. You know, I, I saw a stat there that like, from, from my perspective, the direct benefits of implementing a, cent, uh, a CRM are only about 10%, 90% of the benefits you get are, are indirect. Um, yes time saving, uh, better service, reduced, uh, data loss in terms of, you know, like I, I created a, a, an object yesterday just to track all the memberships to networking events, not just for me, but you know, for all the team. So now instead of, um, you know, we, we don't want to overdo, say for example, if there's a, a BNI group or, a, or a, um, uh, some other, you know, membership for an organization like, um, you know, Australian leadership Academy or something like that then, you know, you, you don't, if you've got a thousand staff, you don't want to have everyone's a, a member. You mainly want to have a selected corporate member for that one because not everyone can attend every event, but then you've got some representation. There may be multiple chapters and anyway, you, you reduces the duplication or, or, or um, it doesn't remove it completely, but it definitely re reduces the duplication of effort um, yes. and, and saves the, the communication time. So, uh, I guess the, the next question is what's next for business? Oh, I, I think uh, systemizing and using software to systemize because the larger your business is. So even if you have say five staff, if you've, if you're wasting time in a business and say an hour a day and you haven't got something systemized and you've got, that's 10 hours a day. You know, if it's two, uh, five staff, two hours, that's 10 hours. You map mm. that out over a week. You know, that's 25 hours. You map that out over a year. You know, you're yeah. talking thousands of hours. So yeah. I think I think it's getting 
getting things where you can systemized and processed uh, driven to, to move forward, to be able to be competitive. Mm. I think right now, if you, there's uh, it's extremely competitive and those who are systemized and process driven, uh, I think they have a lot more um, compatibility inside of the market than someone who's not. Well, it's just so much more accessible these days. Yeah. Like people, there, there's over 8,000 marketing technology products on, uh, out there. And yeah. um, so now the battle isn't uh, having a system, it's which one and yeah. you know, selecting, switching between. Um, and it gets really, really convoluted because they're all just not quite good enough. Like they're just, there's one thing they don't do. You don't like how it clicks. You don't like how it, you know, it wiggles on the screen or something like that. And then people sort of, choose it on that and they end up hopping through five, 10, 20 different things. So uh, yeah. I think it's very important to be strategic yes. um, to, to choose smart and think about where the business is going in the next three to five years. Um, and, you know, the, the speed at which tech has enabled businesses to, to adapt is phenomenal. Uh, and so people need to stay relevant. So you need something that will grow with you. Yeah. And, and, you know, like I said at the start, we, we always talk about having a plan. And, and I think that is pretty much um, the, the key is not just a, the plan on the software you're going to implement, but the plan on where you see your business going, when you're going to need this, what's the trigger point, you know, is it X yep. amount of staff, X amount of revenue, you are just constantly solving problems. I, I think the one thing, where, where do I think the future is going as well on top of that? I think technology is one part of it. But I think the other part that we're really coming back to in the times that we're in is I think it needs our systems and processes need to be humanized. Mm. So we need to have, because at the end of the day, we're dealing with somebody, we're dealing with a person, mm. male, female, whatever. And we need to be able to have that humanized uh, communication, even inside of our systems and processes. So I think it's really important that we give that some thought as well, moving forward. So technology is one thing but people are uh, a really important part of that process as well. And making sure that we, we really do think about people mm. and how we can deliver them value. I think on the, the automation perspective, you know, we do quite a lot of that, but it, again, it's just the old in, it's all almost all internal. So, yeah. you know, here's a task to follow up for someone on their yeah. birthday or, um, you know, uh, send a card or, or, or do something like that. It's not always bombard them with 50 emails. Uh, because if we've seen anything, everyone's getting bombarded with emails and, you know, LinkedIn spam and, yeah. and people are sick of it. They just do not respond to that at all. So less is more. I think that's the other part coming yeah. up. Yeah. I think like, I think you make a great point. Mm. Uh, everyone's getting bombed. Like, you know, someone sends an email every day and, mm. you know, different for every industry and different for every process. But I know for me, if someone sends me an email every day, I just don't have the time to read it. So then I'm more, less likely to read any of them. So it's really thinking about the end customer and mm. who they really are and how can you add value without bombarding them? Well, if, it, if it's going to clog up your inbox, you're just going yeah. to unsubscribe straight away. Absolutely. And them completely. Yeah. Um, you know, per, the rush to personalization is huge. So, yeah. you know, like I said, you know, getting someone's birthday or, um, you know, understanding what they you know what what wine they like or you know yeah. someone's favorite coffee we had a client that wanted um when they have this high net worth client walk in they just go straight to the boardroom and five minutes later someone walks in with their favorite coffee made just the way they like it um, and that kind of experience marketing is huge yeah and i think that's where we're going with all of this with technology mm -hmm. to help us deliver more impactful and and better uh, experiences for the end customer at the end of the day. That's what makes us different because why, why be in business if you're just going to be the same as everyone else? We want to and, do and something different, it. add value, be different. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic having you. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you're listening, uh, you can take, you can find out more about uh, customer development process uh, on the website at varana.com.au. Um, and at the episode comments, I will be pu putting the uh, website link and uh, Darren's LinkedIn URL. So p feel free to reach out and, uh, and have a chat. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions or you'd like to be on the show, you can check out relevate.com.au and fill out the contact form. Otherwise, take care.